Hello. Today we will talk about a question that is not only one of the most important questions ever asked, but dare I say misunderstood by most Christians. How can I be saved? In John 3 verse 16 we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is it that easy? You believe that God exists and get a free ticket to heaven? Because if so, the devil will also be in heaven. As it says in James 2 verse 19, You believe that there is one God. You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. So obviously it is not enough to believe in the existence of God to be saved. But what does it mean to believe then? Because it clearly says that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The first step is to realize your need for a savior. A doctor can only help you if you accept the diagnosis. And the diagnosis is written clearly in the Bible in Romans 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are diagnosed with a deadly disease called sin. We have disobeyed and transgressed God's law and are therefore guilty. Our own actions have sentenced us to eternal death. When we come to God, we must first realize our own insufficiency and need for a savior. This is the first step in order to get saved. The second step is to repent. On the day of Pentecost, when the multitude, convicted by their sins, cried out, what shall we do? The first word of Peter's answer was repent. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the repentance has to be real and genuine. Repentance includes sorrow for the sin and turning away from it. Let us look at a real-life example of repentance in the Bible. The prayer of King David, after he killed a man and slept with the wife, was sincere and deep. He didn't only pray for pardon, but for a change and purity of heart. He longed for the joy of holiness, to be restored in harmony and communion with God. This was his prayer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. A repentance like this cannot happen of our own power. It has to come from Jesus. Jesus died for us, so we don't have to. The only thing we have to do is accept his gift of forgiveness. The Bible compares the experience of conversion to Jesus dying for our sins. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe 
that we shall also live with him. Like Jesus died on the cross, we also die spiritually. Our old habits and sinful nature is being crucified and our sins are forgiven. We are free from sin and pardoned by Christ. This process is called justification. God declares us righteous. In Titus 3, 5 to 7, we see this process explained in more details. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Jesus receives us and adopts us as his children. In this verse, we can see what justification means practically. The cleansing and renewing of our hearts. It is important to note that justification transforms at the same time it declares. Being justified, we become new creatures through the power of the Holy Spirit and God treats us as just. These are the two parts of justification. To be pardoned or forgiven and to be transformed or reborn or made new. Current theology often separates the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, but that is wrong. Both Jesus and the Holy Spirit are involved in justification and sanctification. But there are conditions to salvation. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And in Philippians 2, 5-8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even a death on the cross. The whole heart must be yielded to God with nothing held back, and we must decide not to continue in disobedience any longer. In John 14 verse 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And to remain in this justified position, the condition is obedience in him. But this obedience doesn't come through my own efforts alone, but through faith in his power to purify my soul. So the two conditions to justification are surrender and obedience. Without these two, there is no justification. It doesn't matter how much you claim it. But isn't this a subtle form of legalism, you might ask? Let's compare salvation to the launch of a space shuttle. What is the cause of the space shuttle going into space? It is the mighty engines firing and supporting the shuttle. If these engines don't fire, nothing will happen. If the engines do fire, the space shuttle will take off with or without anyone on board. Now, if the astronauts want to participate in the launch, they have to do several things. They have to put on their spacesuits, they have to get into the elevator, enter the space shuttle and get into their specially prepared seats. Will any of those things cause the astronauts going to space? No. They can sit in their seats for three months and wait and nothing will ever happen without the rockets, the engines firing. The various things the astronauts must do to go to space are not causes of spaceflight, but conditions. What if the astronauts suddenly decide that all oh, those things are legalistic? You see, there's cause and there's conditions. The astronauts simply fulfill the conditions that will get them to the place where the launch is happening. The same goes for justification. We can obey perfectly for the next 50 years and not be one centimeter closer to eternal life. The only cause for salvation is the grace expressed by Christ's death on the cross. If I do not comply with the conditions of salvation, which were surrender and obedience, I refuse to place myself where salvation happens, at the cross. It is not correct to say 
we are justified and saved, and then obedience just follows naturally as the consequence. The astronauts, they cannot wait to comply with the conditions to after the launch already happened. Both cause and conditions are essential for the process of justification and salvation. Some say that we can have assurance of salvation because God unconditionally loves us. But let's look at the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was loved unconditionally through all of his escapades, but only when he came back home he had a personal assurance of salvation. Jesus also loved Judah, who betrayed him. Yes, we can have assurance of salvation, but only if self is completely surrendered to God. The greatest danger facing the average Christian today is no longer legalism, but a false assurance of salvation. The notion that you are saved no matter the conditions. And finally, let me explain what legalism actually is, because most Christians have a wrong understanding of it. Legalism is not the law, because if so, God would be a legalist. Legalism is not obedience, because otherwise Jesus would be a legalist, because Jesus obeyed his Father, God. Legalism is a counterfeit way of salvation. It projects obedience as the only way to salvation, and it makes works or obedience the cause for salvation. Do you realize the danger of this idea? If obedience is only the result of being saved, then it makes it possible to think you are saved while still continuing in known sin and disobedience to God. This is actually a very common belief held onto by most Christians today, to think that obedience comes after justification, an extremely dangerous belief, because it makes you feel safe while continuing to disobey and holding on to known sins which actually separate you from God. If God would tolerate this separation, Jesus would not have needed to come to die for our sins. Obedience is not the fruit of salvation. It is both the condition and the result of salvation. I repeat, obedience is not the fruit of salvation, but both the condition and the result of salvation. I hope this helped you understand the process of justification and answer the question how to be saved. Thank you for listening and make sure to like and subscribe. If you have any more comments, then leave them down below and I will answer every single comment. Thank you.